All right. Good afternoon, guys. PD212. This is our second week. Uh, we all survived week one. So that's, that's exciting, right? Uh, today, uh, I'm going to create this video and uh, I'm actually live on YouTube as well. Uh, but I'm recording this video and uh, it's going to be, um, it's going to include feedback concerning what you submitted already uh, last night. Uh, a reminder of what we have to do until next Sunday midnight. And then I'm going to cover chapter three. Chapter three uh, is a long chapter. And um, I usually uh, cover it in three lectures. So it would be about this week and half of next week. But uh, I think if everything goes well, I think I'm gonna try and uh, finish the whole chapter uh, today, right now. And then for next week, um, you can still be using it for this week and half next week based on your, your LOs. But next week, I'm only gonna um, create a video only about chapter four, okay? Nothing really changes. I just don't want to break chapter two uh, into two videos. We'll see. It's uh, right. so I'm going to start really quickly and talk about uh, LO, about the LOs. Uh, first of all, the extra credit opportunity. I can go right here and I can share my screen. Uh, that's me live on YouTube. So that's not what I'm trying to share. This is what I'm trying to share. Uh, let me see. There we go. Okay, so, so here, you know, for week number one, you submitted this one, which I have already graded, and then LO1 and LO2. In both of them, um, on average, we did very well. Uh, we're still getting to know each other. So if you do, didn't get full credit, I give you some comments. In general, uh, from what I've written down here in my notes, you know, um, it is, I, I've tried to be very gracious and uh, you see my grades are not, I, I try to, uh, to give you as much as possible and then a little bit more, but uh, I want you to uh, read the LOs carefully every time and just follow the instructions. Uh, if we follow the instructions, you, you're not going to skip anything. You're not going to miss anything. So just be mindful, uh, read the whole thing, and answer all the questions. I'm giving you a lot of details, so just follow my lead, and we'll be fine. All right? Now, uh, for next week, we have two LOs based on Chapter 3, LO3. Um, two questions, right? Which are the three basic imaginary planes? I'm going to cover that today, okay? You have to explain the other three, and this is the first one, this is the second one, and this is the third one. That's it. That's question A. B, you have to give me one example, okay? This movement moves in that plane, and that movement moves in that plane, and the third uh, exercise that I'm describing moves in that third plane. Done. Three planes explain them, and then three examples, one per plane. Good? All right, and then we're going to LO4. Again, same chapter. I'm going to explain this today. A lot of people have a little bit of trouble because this is the first time uh, they're hearing about open chain and closed chain movement. Also, closed pack and open pack position. Okay? So I want you to explain it to me in your own words. And then give me an example of an open chain, an example of a closed, a closed chain movement, an example of a closed pack, an example of an open pack position. Four explanations, four examples. That's it. No more, no less. Clear? Hope so. All right, so I'm going back here. That's for today. As I said, I'm covering a little bit more today with this video. And then next week, I'm just going to cover chapter four. And then the fourth week, I'm going to go with X-Fees, which is, again, a huge chapter. Uh, anatomy and kinesiology is uh, uh, 
it can be covered in one video, obviously. There are two different courses, <laughs> right? But uh, I will do my best. I will do my best. I'll try to be as short as possible, simplify things. And at this point for this course, we don't need all this detail. We're just going to scratch the surface. All right. Uh, let me see where my, let me stop sharing this. And then let me go find the PowerPoint for chapter three. All right, let me uh, go right here. Okay, excellent. So, um, first of all, uh, kinesiology, um, uh, a word of Greek origin, right? The study of human movement. And the kinesis part means movement, right? And the uh, logic part means the study. And of course, it has it has to do with a lot of um, subdisciplines, as uh, such as biomechanics, musculoskeletal anatomy, neuromuscular physiology. Uh, concerning biomechanics, you're taking a class most likely with me later on. Uh, that's called analyzing human movement. And we're talking about biomechanics a lot. Um, for now, know that biomechanics, we split usually in kinematics, which is how we move. And then kinetics, uh, why we move the way we move. So we go a little bit uh, deeper and try and find the forces in kinetics. Both of them important, just different. All right, let's start. Uh, anatomical position. Uh, body erect, fit together, palms facing forward, thumbs facing away from the body, fingers extended, it looks like this. Okay. Who cares? Uh, well, we care uh, because one of the major um, ways that we can use this is as a reference position. Okay. So you can call me and try to explain something. You're like, okay. Start from the anatomical position and then do this. Or you can just compare the way I stand to this and make some comments tomorrow. Okay? So as a reference position, it is really, really important. Pretty basic. Hope you get it. Okay? Nothing too complex here. Now, planes of motion. Some of you may have heard of this before. Maybe not. We have three of them. They're imaginary. Okay, and the sagittal, the frontal, and the transverse. And they really help us understand the way we, we move. Okay, so in this picture, we can see all three of them. Uh, they, they look like they go through the middle of the body, but that's an easier way to remember them and also to teach the planes, but they don't have to. Okay, I'll give you an example frontal plane, okay? If I do lateral raises with dumbbells for my shoulders, that's a movement in the frontal plane. If I do frontal raises, there's a movement in the sagittal plane, okay? If I rotate to some Russian twists, that's a movement in the transverse plane. Now, can I have movements in more than one plane? Yes, yes I can, yes I can. They're more complex, right? And potentially more functional, right? Because that's how we move. We move in all three planes uh, in real life. Let me give you an example. If I do a forward lunge, that will be a movement in the sagittal plane, right? Back and forth. If uh, I keep doing that, and then at the same time, I add, I add the, the lateral raise, Right? Now I'm moving two planes. I'm moving the front plane and I'm moving the sagittal plane. Yes, does it make sense? Now, what can I do is, as I'm doing the lunge and the lateral raise, I also twist to the right, and then the next step, I twist to the left. So now I'm moving in all three planes. As you understand, moving in more planes makes it more complex. And we carry in many ways, and I'll give you an example. When we teach a movement, uh, we usually break it down and we teach one plane and then we teach all planes 
separately, and then we these two of them together, and then we add the third one. Okay. Um, moving in more planes, uh, as I said, is more technical. Just, just, and I'm just giving you that example just to see it from an instructional point of view. Tomorrow, you, you know, be in code, for example. That's very important. That's really, really important. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot pass this class without knowing this. So please put a lot of emphasis, read it again and again and again, and make sure you understand it. If you don't, please let me know. All right, center of gravity. I have some notes in front of me. I don't want to forget anything. Uh, I need to say it's so much information. All right. Um, it is a theoretical point. And that center of gravity we're talking about is where the weight force of the object uh, can be considered to act. And it really depends on the body position and it can change as we move. Like as a diver moves, the center of gravity moves as well. If we go here, you can see that the center of gravity, we see figure 3.3, right? The center of gravity will move as the person comes out of the chair, all right? And then we have the line of gravity. So the line of gravity is again, is imaginary vertical plane, it goes through some important sides of the body and it's about body alignment and posture. And for us here, we see uh, 3.4, we can see from the lateral side, we can also see from the posterior side. And then again, we can use that information to compare and contrast. So you can take the way I stand and see if I'm actually, my line of gravity is the way it was supposed to be. And if it's not, you know, then we go into uh, corrective movements or corrective exercises to fix that. All right, so here, table 3.1, um, it's really important for us to know those locations and positions. Uh, and usually they go into pairs, anterior, posterior, superficial, deep, proximal, distal, and so on and so forth. I really want you to go over this. This is really important terminology. You're not gonna remember everything at once. It's impossible, but we need to start now. We need to start now because whatever you become, like you wanna be a PT, a AT, um, even if you go into nutrition, I'm not even talking about coaching, right? It's strength coaching or sport coaching, even personal training, anything. You need to know that terminology. You need to know so we can communicate, right? So again, it may look like a lot now, but we need to start learning these things, okay? All right, so hmm, joint movement, all right. Uh, here, that's another thing. I broke this table into two slides so you can see it a little bit bigger. Uh, it's in our book, of course, um, table 3.2. Again, we can take those movements into pairs, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and so on and so forth. It's really important for us, again, to start knowing this terminology and what it means. You see flexion, decrease of the joint ankle. Extension, increase of the joint ankle. That's important to know. That's important to know. That's why we say extension leg. That's why we say um, uh, flexion of the trunk. Those are important things to understand, okay? So slowly but surely you have to go all over those things and make sure you understand them and you remember as many as possible. All right, uh, let's keep going. We have a lot of information. So when we talk about uh, anatomy, we talk about bones, joints, and muscles and the way they interact. And the way they interact, it will define the range of motion, how many degrees uh, a joint can flex or extend or whatever movement it does. Uh, which is the movement that we're actually talking about and how much force uh, it can produce. So here, when we go into the skeletal system for now, we need to just break it down into two large uh, groups, if I may. Um, so you see that appendicular skeleton and you see the axonal skeleton, right? What's the axonal skeleton? What do you see? You see the skull, right? You see the ribs, yes. Do you see the spine? Yes. 
uh, the stern, yes. So anything other than that is the particular scope. And we need to remember that as well. All right, so let's talk about bones, okay? Bone structure. Uh, we usually uh, pick the femur bone that you see in front of you in figure 3.6, because it's easy um, for um, reasons of, you know, like educational reasons. So the, 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 the main part here in the middle is diaphysis, okay? And then on these edges, we'll have the epiphysis. In between here, we'll have the metaphysis. Now, uh, if a bone is not mature yet, we'll also have epiphysis place right here, which means that's where the bone grows, okay? Now, when we talk about types, we have compact and spongy. Compact will, have, will be more dense, and sponsor will be less dense. Again, analyzing human movement, uh, we will talk about things more in more depth. Compact is um, stronger in a way, right? But it can break easier. Spongy can, um, because it's less dense, it can absorb more force, it doesn't break that easy. Okay, so let me, keep moving in my notes. So when we talk about shapes, right? Um, we have the long, we'll have um, long, like the one we just talked about, uh, femur, right? And then we have short like carpals, and then we'll have flat like uh, the sternum, and then we'll have regular like the vertebrae, and then we'll have uh, systemoid like the patella, okay? Now, the articular system. The articular system has to do mainly with the articulations, um, usually called joints, uh, right? So the articular system is a joint, which is the bones and the ligaments all together. What is a ligament? It's a tissue. It's a connective tissue, which is tough. What does it anchor? I want you to know that. Ligaments anchor bone to bone. They do not anchor bone to muscle. Okay, so the anchor bone to bone. We're good? All right. Now, um, synanthrodial joints, no movement. And the anthrodial joints, some movement. The anthrodial move, a lot of movement. And the most common are the synovial. And that's where we're going to stay for a little bit. Here, we, in order for a joint to be characterized as synovial, um, we, we need all these five characteristics. All right. And if we see this, you, you see the, the, the ligament that is attaching the bone to bone. It's a pair of ligaments, right? We have the synovial membrane right here that produces this fluid all the time in between, okay? Cartilage between the two bones. And this is a capsule, right? Capsule, we have the fluid in between and we have the ligaments on the outside. All right, for now, that's enough. Um, those are the classification of joints. Again, I'm not gonna go into all the tables. One thing I wanna mention because a lot of our students get confused is that um, right down here, right? The knee is a bicondylar, which means it has two degrees of freedom, which means we're talking about two movements because they have, we have the flexion, extension movement, but there's also a little bit of rotation. Okay, so it's bicondylar. I just wanted to mention that because it's a common mistake. And it used to, be, it, it was a question once at the ACSM exam and some missed it. Oh, right. Hmm. Here, again, you can go over them by yourself. I don't know, like you see elbow, the system of the, we talked about snow, we will talk about flex and extension, right, decrease or an increase, uh, and then the sides of the plane. I hope you remember all this, but this, you can go one by one, use those columns and make sure you understand. What's the hinge? Um, do we have it here? Yes, right here, hinge uniaxial movement, such as elbow extension and flexion, uniaxial. 
Okay. So we can go into this and make sure you understand all the terminology. If not, you go back and you make sure you it is clear. All right, let's go here. And this is, I guess, very interesting or extra interesting because it is part of your uh, the things that you have to submit on Sunday. Okay. All right, so the back position has to do with the joint congruence. If there's high level of joint congruency and um, the joint is not loose, it's a closed pack, okay? So this would be a closed pack. This is an open pack. Who cares? Well, we care a lot. And especially we see a lot of examples in athletic training and physical therapy, okay? Because, for example, um, there are muscles that go through multiple joints, and we're going to talk about that as well. And when uh, there's close pack at one, you can do certain movements or certain, certain ranges to the other uh, joints. And that's important, for example, for rehabilitation, or uh, it is a way to check your progress um, in rehabilitation. Also, um, let me give you another example. When, uh, let's say you get on this desk and you jump off the desk and you land on the floor. Would you tell me uh, I should land with um, my knees in a closed pack position or in an open pack position? Open pack, right? Why? Because in an open pack, I may be, it may be looser, but it may absorb more force. So. All these are practical, right? I just want you to understand it, it's about joint congruency and then understand how we can use it when we're prescribing exercise. Now, uh, open chain and closed chain movements. Here, think about the distal segment of the joint. Is it fixed or it moves in space? So if I'm doing back, if I'm doing lat pull down, I'm using the machine the distal segment of my joint as I'm pulling down, is it fixed or it moves in the open space? If it moves in the open space, it's open chain. If I'm doing chin ups and I'm going up, right? This is stable, that's a closed chain. Again, think about leg press and squatting. Which one is open and which one is closed? And then think about who cares? Tomorrow you're a strength coach. Are you gonna tell me that it's more functional for my sport to do leg press or squat? And why? Okay, think about my sport, think about my movements. And if you're trying to find exercises that have high transferability, so they imitate the movement that I'm gonna do later on in the field, right? Or in the ice, whatever sport I'm playing, you have to prescribe exercise pretty similar to that, right? Okay, think about all these things and let me know if you have any questions. Range of motion, um, when we talk about range of motion is a degree of movement within the joint, right? And it can be active if I just do it by myself or passive if somebody else let's say stretches me, uh, passive uh, ROM ROM is bigger, larger than active, okay? A lot of people are hypermobile and hypermobile. How do we know that? As you can see here, we have normal values and we compare and contrast. If you are above that, you're hypermobile. If you're below that, you're hyper. The joint stability, do we wanna be stable? Well, it depends. That's, that's a huge uh, thing that we're not gonna talk about it right now you know, during this chapter, but we will later on. So, but this, the stability in any case depends on the ligaments, okay? The muscles and the tendons, the fascia, and what is fascia? What is fascia? Okay, we, we hear about it, like they talk about it a lot lately. So what, what do you think fascia is, okay? It's 
mainly collagen, right? That um, you can see that it differentiates or groups different muscles, right? It's above the muscle, uh, as a, if you want to think about it level wise. Atmospheric pressure, more pressure outside than inside the joint, that's important. And then the bony structure is also important. When I'm trying to extend my arm, there's a thing, a process called electronome right here, right? But it doesn't let me extend it more. So that has, that affects, the way I'm designed affects the stability of this joint, okay? And if you, anyway, I'm not gonna go and compare different sexes now because men and women are a little bit different here, but you get the point for now. All right, the muscular system. Okay, so skeletal muscles. We have so many muscles, right, in our body. And the skeletal muscle is the muscle that we can actually voluntarily move. Um, 600 muscles, do we have to know all of them? No, do you have to know at least 100 of them, the most important, yes. We're gonna cover some of them today. Again, don't freak out, just start learning. Start learning and it will be fine. Cardio muscle, you understand? Um, no voluntary movement and smooth muscle is the muscle uh, of the other organs, around the other organs, of the other organs. Again, no voluntary activation. And then we'll have the tendons and the bushes. The bushes, we're gonna talk, give examples in a little bit there in between tendons and some bony structures and they help absorb shock and make movement more smooth. Okay, again, a lot of muscles, just know the basics. I'm gonna cover some today. All right, we keep going. A lot left to cover. Uh, fiber architecture. As I say here, the key is, is it in line with the pool of muscle? If it is in line, we say the architecture is parallel. If it's not in line, but there is an angle, right? Talk about pending. Um, the joint action. So, does a muscle act upon one joint? Uniarticular. Two joints, biarticular. More than two, multiarticular. That's pretty much it. Here we have this. Um, we see the strap. We see the fusiform. I want to just stay a little bit in um, the last three. You see uh, the uni, and, they, and it's on the one side of the, the tendon, uh, bipinnate, both sides of the tendon, and then multipinnate. It starts from here and then expands like this. This is again, pretty important. And I want us to stay here for a second. All right, so uh, action potential, we're not gonna talk about it right now. It just leaves our brain, right? To do some kind of movement, like the movements I'm doing right now while I'm talking or moving my hands. That will travel, we'll go to the muscle, right? Through our nervous system, we'll go to the muscle, we'll activate the muscle. The muscle, it will pull the, the tendon. We said the tendon anchors a bone to a muscle, right? So the muscle will pull, the muscle will pull the tendon and the tendon is attached to a bone, so it will move. So here, if I give you an example, my biceps, right? My bicep is attached to a tendon, which is attached to a bone. So now that if, if I contract this, it pulls the bone here. So it pulls this, uh, the tendon, I'm sorry, which tendon pulls the bone and I can do a bicep curve, all right? All right, let's stay here for a second. I say, I write down here, muscles pull, not push. Hmm. Do, we, do we talk about push movements all the time, like chest press, triceps, shoulders press, and so on and so forth? Yes. But then why do I say muscles pull? They don't push. So uh, we're gonna cover that later on when we talk about the slide filament theory, right? But I want you to understand that muscles pull and contract this way. And when they contract, they become shorter. So they pull. If all the muscles pull, how do I push? Well, think about pushing a door. As you're pushing a door, let's say you're using your triceps, right? Your triceps again become shorter as you extend your arm right? Shorter. So again, they're pulling. It looks like a push movement because we're designed in a magnificent, in a magnificent way. And what do I mean? 
we are designed in opposing pairs of muscle. And that gives us the opportunity, bicep triceps, right, to do movements this way and this way. In both cases, the muscle, the agonist, the prime mover is pulling, but the, sometimes the movement looks like a push. Make sure you understand that. Now, can I, uh, usually when I move one muscle, the opposing muscle is relaxing so I can do this. But sometimes I, I, there's a thing called co contraction. What is that? So th those muscles, the opposing pair, they contract at the same time. Think. Do you do, you do any exercises or movements at the gym that have to do with core contraction? What about a plank? Think about it. You lay down, get in the position, and then you activate the muscles on both sides of your spine. You activate your abs by activating the lower back muscles. Those are opposing muscles and they co-contract. Also, when you're doing a squat, a deadlift, movements like that, those muscles co-contract to keep your spine stable, okay? But most of the time, most of the time, when, when you know, we do especially isolated movements, one of those, um, two muscles of that pair will contract and the other one will relax so they can like biceps, triceps, and the quads, hamstrings, and examples like that. Now, the prime mover is called agonist. The opposing muscle is the antagonist. And then we have stabilizers and synergies. If I'm doing a bicep curl, my biceps are the agonist, my tricep are the antagonist, right? My forearm muscles can be the synergies. Stabilizers can be my shoulder muscles, my deltoids. I hope that makes sense. Moving. Um, here again, go over those tables by yourself. As you can see, there are different columns here. The joint, the movement, the range of motion, the major agony muscle, and some examples. Okay? Excuse me. Um, when we talk about joint structure, we have to think about all of this. And this is what we're going to do little by little. Uh, there's a lot to cover today, so forgive me in advance. Um, all right, shoulder. When we talk about the shoulder, um, let's start with bones. We have three main bones. The humerus, the scapula, and the clavicle. Okay. Uh, this structure is very important because it connects the main body here with the periphery. If we didn't have this bone, this small bone right here, there would be no connection between this part of our body and our upper extremity. Okay? Here we have a lot of um, ligaments because we have several joints. Um, you see the glenohumeral ligament, very important brachiomalar ligament, same, acromioclavicular, coracoclavicular, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't want you to remember all this. I just want you to have basic idea at this point. I, this is something I want you to know, the abduction, adduction, the horizontal abduction, the horizontal abduction, internal rotation, external rotation, the circumduction that we can do uh, without shoulder. Shoulder is very mobile. Right, which is great, but also it's not very stable, which is not great if we see from an injury perspective. Um, the scapula is very important, and you can see all the movements that the scapula can do, okay? Uh, this is something I wanna stay for a second, and we're talking about the rhythm, the scapula humoral rhythm. Again, our, our body is designed in a phenomenal way. So, uh, as you can see, or maybe, I mean, I'll, I'll explain right now. We can move our arm. Let's say we're doing a lateral raise, okay? We can move our arm to a point. After that point, if the scapula does not move, 
then we, wouldn't, we will never be able to raise our arm all the way up. So we can go up to 130 degrees, but then as you can see here, the scapula starts turning and turning and turning and tilting to a point that it helps us go all the way up. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to raise our arm all the way up. We can do that because this capsule can move, this is the right hand, the right side, can move the way it can move. I just want you to remember that. That's pretty fascinating. All right, moving along, moving along. Um, oh yeah, here, what do we see here? So this is the front side and this is the posterior side, anterior side, posterior side. You see, we always already use the terminology. So here um, we can see a uh, busa here and another busa here, which I, as we said, they're very important with uh, sock absorbing and making moves smoothless. If we fall down and we destroy them, it's really hard to, it is impossible to have create new ones. You see this like gel-like small capsules, right? So um, they're really <laughs> small, but really important in the movement. Now, one thing I want you to remember here is uh, the supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus muscle, teres minor muscle, and subscapularis muscle. S I T S seats. These are really important because they're the, the, the rotators, the rotators of our shoulder. Okay. And a lot of times we, have, we are very uh, strong in the anterior side of our um, deltoid, but we're not as strong in the back side. And that creates the rounding of the shoulder in a lot of injuries. That's why a lot of athletic trainers, physical therapists, and coaches like myself, uh, I always advise to do some extra external rotations, for example, when they're having shoulder day, because we don't like imbalances, okay? Imbalances is not a good thing. All right, major muscles here, you see the pec major, pec minor, deltoid. Uh, we need to know the basic muscles, okay? Again, don't freak out slowly, but surely start learning and go back and learn more and go back and learn more. One comment, because a lot of people don't realize it is the traps. The traps are not just up here, right? The traps come down all the way. Uh, that goes back to the rotator cuff muscles, okay? Uh, supraspinatus, in, infraspinatus, teres, minor, and subscapularis, seats. All right. Keep going, elbow. Again, a lot of information, but we'll do it together. I'm trying to explain as much as possible and keep it as simple as possible. All right. Elbow. Uh, three bones, right? We have the humerus and we have the radius and we have the ulna. And we have the ulna collateral ligament, we have the anal ligament here, and we have basically three um, joints. One, two, and three, okay? This is the, the inner part of the joint, that's why it says medial, right? And this is lateral. This is closer to the midline, this is further from the midline. That's how I know, too, for example. That's one way to know. All right, flexion, extension, pronation, supination. This is something you have to know. All right, uh, basic muscles. Again, um, triceps, biceps, deltoid, that major. And then um, you can see the surface line. That's from the back side, triceps, we have three heads, that's why we call them triceps. Um, again, the superficial and the ligaments. Okay. Um, let's go 
and move to the least hands and fingers. One second to find it in my notes because I don't want to forget it. All right. So here we have 29 bones, starting from the radius and the ulna. And then we have uh, eight carpals. We have five metacarpals. And then we have 14 phalanges. Now 14 phalanges because we have three, six, nine, 12. But this one, the thumb has only two. Don't forget that. Okay, 14, not 15. Three, six, nine, 12 plus two. Please know the movements of the wrist. That's pretty important. And some basic muscles, okay? These are the flexors of the wrist. That's what kind of balance and so on and so forth. And these are the extensors. Okay? And that's the electronome that I was talking to you about a second ago. All right, um, pelvis and hip. Let's see. One thing I didn't want to forget here is a lot of times we talk about the carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, we're going to cover that in analyzing human movement. Okay, but that's, I just wanted to mention uh, that that's a common injury. All right. All right. Okay. The pelvic girdle. Here we have <laughs> uh, the basic link between the skeleton and the lower extremities. And it's very, very important to understand. <coughs> and the basic bones are the sacrum and then the coxae. Coxae uh, consists of three bones, ischium, pubis, and ilium. And of course, this part has a twin, which is on the other side. And they connect at the back with a ton of ligaments that we're going to see in a second, but also with the pubic synthesis at the front right here. OK? Again, a ton of ligaments, it is not something that I'm interested of you now. Um, a couple of things that I want you to remember from here. Um, um, the acetabular labrum right here is like a lip that comes out, which gives more depth. And then the head of the femoral can go inside and gives more mobility and also uh, sock absorption. So that's, again, uh, another way to understand how beautifully designed we are. These are the basic movements, the rotation, the lateral tilt, anterior tilt that we talk about a lot of times, right, and the posterior tilt. When we talk about tilt, we're talking about tilt right now of the pelvis, so think about pelvis, okay? Here we're talking about the hip. We have flexion extension. You need to know this, right? This is flexion of the hip. These are the hip flexors right here, and this is extension, okay? So extensors of the hip are the gluteus muscle, okay? This is very important, external rotation, internal rotation. All right, basic muscles here, uh, we have superficial and deep uh, on the left side. Again, the gluteus, we have the gluteus maximus, right? The gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus, as we can see better right here. Uh, from the front side here, so we have the quads, and the quads, you see the vasus de medius, uh, vasus medialis, vasus lateral, lateralis, and then the rectus femoris. Those are the four muscles I would like you to remember. Again, one, two, three, four, nothing else. From the back side, I want you to remember biceps femoris, biceps femoris, uh, semibranosus, and what else? Semitendinosus right here. So one, two, three. Those are the three muscles I want you to remember. From the lateral side, pretty much what we have already explained, uh, TFL, TFL is a common muscle a lot of times with foam roll. So it's kind of practical a lot of times to know what it is. Knee, okay. Let's go to the knee. We're getting there. We're getting lower and lower and lower. Eventually, we're going to go to the ankle and then we'll be done. Oh, we also have the spine. So, <laughs> a lot of information today, but I'm in there. 
Okay. I'm just trying to cut up my notes because I just keep talking when I'm losing. All right, um, then the knee, largest joint of the body. Okay, don't forget that. Um, subject to overuse a lot of times. Here, as you can see, um, we have three bones that are really important. We have the femur, we have the tibia, and we don't have the feet. The fibula is not part of the knee, the patella is. See, so tibia, the patella, which is here, if it was here, and the femur. Okay, you see we have uh, a lot of ligaments, the medial part and the lateral part. This is the outside, this is the inside, we have the meniscus. And again, analyzing human movement, we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about ACL and all the crucial ligaments. Just, there's no that's that much for now. The fibula is not part of the knee joint. Okay, all right, Q angle. All right, we have here two lines. Those two lines create an angle, and that's called Q angle. It's seven degrees for men, 13 for women. Women have a wider uh, pelvis, and it's okay that they have a larger Q angle, okay? Now, those two lines, one starts from uh, the anterior superior iliac spine, and comes all the way to the middle of the patella, and then we'll have another line from the middle of the patella to the tibial tuberosity, which is right here. Okay, so those two lines, if you put them together, they create uh, an angle. This is normal. You see now the knees are caving in here, right? So that increases the Q angle and that decreases the Q angle. That's called volume and that's called volume. I want you to remember that. Flexion extension. Um, all right. So far, so good. Um, I think I gave you the wrong numbers about the Q angle. Um, it's 13 in males and 18 in females. I think I, I'm not sure, but I think I, I as I was going fast, I gave you the wrong. Okay, what do we have left? Well, let's go and talk about the ankle and the foot. And perfect. All right, so there are a lot of bones. Uh, as you can see, uh, 26 to be precise. We, we, we split the, the, the foot into three um, functional units. We have the, the fourth foot, the midfoot, and the posterior. Okay. Um, so the, the fourth foot contains the five metatarsals and 14 phalanges. Again, uh, not 15. Okay. Uh, the great toe has only um, two. The midfoot now here um, contains five tarsal bones a navicular cuboid and three uh, cuneiforms and the hip foot here contains the calcaneus and the talus. All right, 26 bones in total. Concerning now ligaments, we have very large ligaments, okay? Approximately 100 ligaments. That's how much our body is designed, trying to uh, keep it stable. Anterior, posterior, talofibular, that's kind of uh, classic. Um, Calcaneo fibular, again. Now we have the deltoid, that's how it's called, deltoid ligament complex. So here, those are the ones that you should know. Um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, that's more than enough for now. You have anatomy and physiology, one and two. You have kinesiology, you have analyzing human movement with me. Uh, you, you'll learn everything <laughs> in time. Definitely, I want you to know the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. As you can see here, this is not a flexion. This is an extension, but it's not 
being called sorry this is this is extension but this is not called extension it's called plantar flexion okay so that's the difference so this is dorsiflexion it is a flexion this is an extension but it's called plantar flexion so the extension of the ankle is called plantar flexion normal inversion either don't forget this all right as we go About the movements, muscles, tibialis, anterior, from the anterior side. Um, Terminus longus, that's something you should remember. Uh, from the back side, you see the gastrocnemius and the soleus, definitely. I'll actually just put all these three together like the medial head, the lateral head, and the soleus, right? This is called triceps. So we have those triceps. Also we have these triceps right here, okay? Just let you know. And then let's talk about the spine. We're almost there. Hang in there, guys. Okay. Spine, really important. Uh, and um, one of the major issues with uh, the spine, right? is that it protects the spinal cord. Really important. Now, um, let's see. We have a lot of bones, as you understand. Uh, we have 25, 24 individual vertebrae, uh, seven to the neck, 12 thoracic, and five of lambda. Okay, so seven, 12, and five. Here you can see how the vertebrae look like. And this is the body of the vertebrae, the vertebra, vertebral body, which looks fine. And the freaky part is at the back, as you can see, with a lot of processes, okay? The spinal cord goes through this, okay? So it goes through this as they stack upon each other. Um, all right, so how many ribs do we have? We have 12, seven are true. You see that three are not true because they're not connected directly, they're connected indirectly with the sternum, and then two of them just floating. Remember that. Um, what else? Uh, we haven't talked about the sacrum down here, right? Uh, sacrum is a large triangular bone that acts as a transition point between the spine and the pelvis. And then the coccyx down here is a form that like the three to five fused bones together. Down as a coccyx. Uh, Kyphosis lordosis scoliosis right here. So that's normal. You see the difference, especially here. And that's lordosis, right? And you see the difference, especially here and here, especially here with this one. And that's uh, kyphosis. Okay, now, in order to, uh, to, to diagnose somebody with uh, low doses of kyphosis, you have to go from the lateral side. Here you have to go for, for the scoliosis from the posterior side, from the back. So you see it's not a straight line, it goes like this. However, I wanna say that normal, normally the spine has four, four, four um, and here it's easier to see it. It has four curves, one, two, three, four, okay? And that's normal. And that's where it's designed like that. It absorbs more shock, it absorbs more weight. And it's, it, we are designed to have full curves, but we're not designed to look like B, C, or D. Ligaments, we have plenty of ligaments. Uh, the most important ones are the anterior and posterior, longitudinal ligaments, which is again, uh, the front and the back of the body, which is the body. The body is, as we said before, right here, this is the body. This is the body, okay? And then we have the ligamentum flavum, which is right here. And then some extra ligaments, inter, in between, and then super, spines right here. All right, what's a disc? What is intervertebral disc? Okay, so we have the nucleus pulposus and the fibrosis in the end plates. Okay, so here you see, it's mostly collagen and water. It's in between the vertebrae, okay? And um, here, 
the nucleus proposis is more water than the fibrosis. So here, as we as we get dehydrated, we lose height. That's what that's what happens as you get uh, older, like me. Okay, you lose height. This one has less water, but is more susceptible to injuries. And of course, as you understand, these are not really easy to uh, recover. And the end plates uh, is what helps us um, pretty much anchor the the whole disc between the two vertebrae. Okay, that's all I want you to know from there. What else do we have? Movement of planes. Yeah, of course, extension flexion, I want you to know that. The lateral flexion, definitely, and rotation. All right, we'll stop here for a second. So as we're moving, are we doing that trunk extension? Is a compound movement. It's called lumbopelvic rhythm, okay? And uh, most degrees are coming from the hips and less degrees are coming from the lumbar. Also, uh, more power, more force is generated by the hip muscles than the lumbar, lower back muscles. So we usually say that the lower lumbar muscles are the weak um, part of this chain, the weak link. And that's why we create machines. Have you ever done back extension in a machine that you actually pull weight, that you sit down? But the fact that you sit down takes the hip function out, right? And you only move your uh, lower back muscles. You activate the stem. So you're trying to make them stronger. Or if you have ever done seated, good morning. So if you don't know what that is, just look it up. Uh, oh, what else do we have here? Uh, muscles, definitely. Um, Synoclis tomastoid is one I want you to remember. Rectospinae, this, this is the, um, the three of them, definitely. What else do we have? Um, do I have anything else in my notes? I don't think so. Um, I'm gonna congratulate you for staying here with me. It's a long, long, long um, video. I'm gonna read with you uh, the take home points, the principles of musculoskeletal functional anatomy of the major joint structures of the human body play a major role in nearly all aspects of the personal trainer's practice, including exercise testing, exercise prescription, and analysis of exercise movements. Thus, the personal trainer is urged to master this principle so that safe, effective, and efficient exercise training programs can be designed to improve musculoskeletal fitness. All right, uh, I wanna wish you a great week. Uh, I wanna wish you a great second week. I'll see you next Monday, right? Tomorrow, office hours, let me know if you need anything. In the meantime, lift intentionally. We'll have to see you. Bye, guys.